Hi everyone, welcome to Alice and Bob. Today I want to talk about block space over blockchains. This is a blog post written by Robert Habermeyer, one of the leading people at Parity. Uh, and together with Gavin Wood, he is one of the co-founders of Polkadot. In this article, he discusses the concept of block space. Uh, which is a really great framework to look at different offerings that blockchains uh, give you uh, and basically shift the focus to not look at all the offerings in the terms of what does a specific blockchain do, but rather how can you view at the block space offering, so at the actual product that a blockchain offers, which is, in the argument of Robert Habermeyer, block space. And I think it's a very interesting article because it allows you to um, compare different blockchains and different ecosystems in the, in the quality of the block space they are producing. And so what I would like to do today is go through this article, read it together with you and comment on a few things. Because I've seen many people on Twitter looking at it uh, and coming up with questions and so I think one first step would be to just have a little bit of a conversation on it and go through it together. Okay, so yeah, the thing, how it's going to go down is we're going to read uh, all of it and there uh, is a little bit of comments. So first, the first chapter is what is block space? So this is a basic definition, how we can view block space, what are different characteristics? Uh, and then uh, he goes into the three characteristics, which is quality, availability, and flexibility. Um, and then uh, goes through all of them and com compares them, uh, looks at them, uh, helps us understand them. Then he goes a little bit into Polkadot uh, and how it views block space, how it uh, generates block space. And then there's a very interesting last chapter here is the mechanisms for allocating block space, uh, which also shows us how the whole field is still very open and we're actually just at the beginning of discovering on how to efficiently allocate block space. Okay, so let's start at the top. Uh, introduction gives a little bit of the context on where we are uh, right now uh, in, the, in the whole industry. So he begins with the blockchain and crypto technology landscape has evolved quite a lot over the last five years. We occupy a different world from when we first set out to build Polkadot. Though much has diverged from our original vision, many of our, our original theses have become canon. For example, our early bet on interoperability and cross-chain composability has progressed from theory to practice and from speculation to fact. A multi-chain future is table stakes now. So he basically reiterates and says that the core idea of interoperability between many different chains, so the multi-chain idea and cross-chain composability uh, is now a reality with Polkadot, with parachains and with the ability to communicate with, between parachains. Uh, and this is that this is the main theory and the main thesis of Polkadot is many different chains being able to communicate. So we are actually only at the very beginning of this journey. You see many different parachains already uh, having their products out and they're starting to communicate. But the real power, the real network effects are these are going to show when they're actually starting to communicate, send messages and chains are starting to react to each other in this environment. So additionally, parachains, as described originally, uh, were essentially optim optimistic roll-ups. Uh, so what this means is that, for example, you have Polygon um, and so on, uh, different layer two solutions on Ethereum, uh, and they are also in a way roll-ups. And what a roll-up means is that you have a chain uh, on a second layer that maybe executes cheaper or executes faster or under different uh, conditions than the underlying chain. And then it rolls up the whole state into a simple message, maybe a hash or maybe just a summary of what happened and posts it to the underlying chain. This is what's called a roll-up. And so uh, similar to uh, Ethereum has Polygon and other layer two solutions, every parachain in a Polkadot uh, or Kusama ecosystem is a roll-up. So additional parachains, shared security and data availability as laid out in a vision paper from 2016 have sent ripples through the world of ideas since and have been a source of architectural inspiration for projects both new and old. 
Yeah, so they're basically saying they were right on track with a few good ideas and that this is uh, some of the leading conversations in crypto right now is about the concepts of shared security, data availability. You can see it in spaces like Cosmos and Avalanche, for example. We have progressed from a universe of a few chains to one with an abundance of chains. But our goal was never to maximize the amount of blockchains for the sake of it, but rather to maximize the amount of work a decentralized ne network can do. Or, in, a, in other words, solve for scalability. The number of blockchains is related to scalability but not identical. And the differences between the two will be clarified here. Yeah, so what he is basically saying, it doesn't matter how many blockchains there are, it is, uh, it is a great thing when you have many different blockchains because it means they can do many different things. But that's not the actual thing we want to achieve eventually. The thing we want to achieve eventually is the amount of work a decentralized network can do. So, for example, look at Bitcoin. What can Bitcoin do? It can send transaction and basically change the balances of different accounts. Uh, and then you have an iteration on that, which is Ethereum, which is basically a virtual machine, a computer on a blockchain. So it can do more work, it can, uh, it's Turing complete, so it can do all kinds of different stuff that a computer can do. But then comes Polkadot or other offerings, which can do even more because they are now offering blockchains that are specializing in the work and so they can do more work or more sophisticated work in a more specialized and more efficient manner. When we, get, when we began Polkadot, we set out to create a system maximizing transaction throughput with, without compromising security guarantees and censorship resistance. The aim has not changed, but progress at the application layer now allows us to lend more color and nuance to this vision. So he says we learned a lot while we created a system that has a lot of transaction throughput. Application and protocol developers alike face new challenges in a multi-chain world. They must balance the requirements of secure execution, censorship resistance, usability, costs and composability. So what he is telling us here is that you have a lot of different teams building blockchains and it's just a super complex field of, of having many, 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 many problems to solve. Uh, and it's not easy to be alone. And so being together in a network of developers uh, or in a network of, of chains can help a lot and, and just helps us scale better together. The emerging concept of block space serves as an abstraction and primitive which encompasses these requirements and goals. Okay, so now we're getting to the core of the matter, which is block space, and so now let's dive in. In this piece, I'll dive deeper into the definition and qualities of block space and how to evaluate different block space offerings in the market. Furthermore, I'll make a case for why we're shifting our perspective from blockchains to block space and why Polkadot is architecturally well suited as the strongest generalized block space producer. Okay, so he's making a bold claim here. He has uh, said that it is the strongest generalized block space producer, which is going to be interesting. So let's see. What is block space? We have a definition here from Chris Dixon from 16 uh, so, uh, what is it called? Anderson Horowitz. Uh, on the Bankless podcast. Block space is the best product to be selling in the 2020s. Okay, so let's see. Block space is the capacity of a blockchain to finalize and commit operations. So you have different kinds of transactions on a blockchain going on and block space is the capacity of the blockchain. So how much of this stuff can a blockchain do? It's a term that's risen to prominence lately. It requires some unpacking. In some sense, it's the primary product of a decentralized consensus system running today. And so with decentralized consensus system, he means things like blockchains, but it could also be other things. Because, for example, you have a Tangle uh, in IOTA, you have uh, hash graphs and so on. So there are different things that are similar to blockchains, but different. And together they are termed de decentralized consensus systems. It's an abstraction for reasoning about what blockchains actually produce whether it is allocated to balance transfers, smart contracts or computation is a concern for the application layer. At a high level, block space is a key ingredient for unstoppable applications. So this is an important property of blockchains is they are unstoppable. Uh, you cannot go to a single computer, turn it off, they are unstoppable. Uh, and so 
it seems that block space is a key ingredient of these unstoppable applications. Unstoppable applications rely on decentralized systems for payment, consensus and settlement or settlement. As such, the application layer is a prime consumer of block space as a good. So you're making this differentiation here of a thing that produces block space and the thing that consumes block space. And the application layer uh, is the thing that consumes it. As with any business, both applications and their developers should be concerned with both the quality and the availability of goods in their supply chain. So he's putting it into the business context or into the context of, of larger operations where you are producing an application, you want to have an unstoppable application, and so sh you should, of course, care about the quality of the products you're using. And in this case, the block, block space. So imagine you want to produce a financial application like a, a, a DEX. It matters a lot if the block space, the quality uh, of the block space is low and you can get hacked, the application can get stopped or whatever. Or if it is of a high quality and you can rely on the underlying chain to just continue working, keep working. Uh, yeah. I'm, for example, there is uh, one certain block space chain that keeps turning on and off again every few months. Uh, many people know what I'm talking about. So you could uh, argue here that uh, maybe this is not the best offering in the space as of now. Okay, block space is an ephemeral good. Uh, so ephemeral, I think it's an uh, interesting English term that not everyone knows. So uh, let's look this one up. Ephemeral means lasting for a very short time. Okay, so block space is an ephemeral good. When you intend to commit an operation to a chain, you need block space in the moment. Not yesterday's, not tomorrow's. So you need the block space of now. Block space is either utilized or it is not. When a chain runs below capacity, consensus resources are wasted on producing unutilized block space. Which basically means the block if the blocks are not full, the block space is not utilized and if the chain is not running at capacity. Mm -hmm. mm. If a rim was the first major innovator in block space offerings. By introducing a virtual machine into the protocol and metering available block space via gas, it allowed the block space within a single block to be quantitatively parceled out to programs on the basis of the amount of computation performed and the storage used. Since then, many projects have embarked on a journey to expand the types of block space. This lens provides insights into the key differentiator between Polkadot, Ethereum, Avalanche, Cosmos, Solana, and newer projects like Eigenlayer or Alflayer. Okay, so what he's saying here is uh, you can look at the, the block space in different ways, and GAS was a very important innovation that allows us to look at block space in a certain way, uh, and in this case, in the uh, way that uh, computations are performed. And so you're measuring, you're metering the computations that are happening in the block space and uh, putting them as the important way to look at it. And you say gas is the way to look at it. But it also, what this also implies is you could look at block space in different ways, not just in a way of gas uh, uh, in terms of computation. There could be other ways. The blockchain scaling trilemma tells us that out of security, latency, and throughput, you can only pick two under heavy load. Okay, this is an important concept and many people, or everyone should know it and not everyone knows it. So let's look at, the, I think the best way to look at it is at an image. So you pu can put into Google or any search engine blockchain scaling trilemma, look for images. And then you see you have a trilemma and usually when you're building a system, uh, you can optimize for two, but usually you, you will get a problem on the first side or you have to come up with complex solutions to make sure that all of the three are guaranteed. Yeah? Um, look it up and think it through because it's an important concept. So the blockchain scaling trilemma tells us that out of security, latency and throughput you can only pick two under heavy load. So you could either pick security and uh, load latency, uh, but then you have to and look at the throughput. You can look at uh, latency and throughput, but then you maybe have to give up on security. Or you can have security and throughput, then you might have to give up on the latency. Okay, 
So in Polkadot, our approach at the base layer has always been to, and if you look at different uh, solutions, you see how they are optimizing for different things. For example, you can look at uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Polkadot, and they optimize for security. Uh, and then, and then it uh, then it diverges a little bit. But for example, Solana optimizes for high throughput, uh, uh, and uh, and low and uh, high latency, a uh, low latency. But you know, uh, it can uh, crash down on the security, uh, as for example, or on the quality of the network, because then sometimes you can have uh, problems with the uptime and so on. Okay, maybe this is not the best example, but let me move on. In Polkadot, our approach at the base layer has always been to maximize both security and throughput when we are forced to make a choice. Okay, so it implies you are forced to make a choice so the system is flexible and adapts to the situation. While the trilemma is helpful in evalu evaluating the theoretical utility of a base layer protocol, the notion of block space allows us to reason better about how that throughput and security are allocated to the application layer. Okay, so it puts the concept of block space also a little bit into competition of uh, being benefit to look at block space offerings. Block space is not a commodity, but rather a class of commodities. Block space produced by different systems will rely on quality, availability and flexibility. The quality of block space can be judged by the security guarantees that the block space that the blockchain provides. The more secure, the higher the quality. Okay, so we're just going into the idea of different chains offer different properties of block space. Without the supply of block space, applications run into congestion or downtime, leading users to experience high fees, long wait times, or front running. Without high quality block space, applications are hacked and drained. Low quality block space is vulnerable to 51% attacks, and toxic shock. Both types of occurrences will be familiar to readers who have spent time observing the blockchain exosystem. These characteristics of block space are a key factor application developers must consider when choosing where to deploy. Okay, so there is a little bit to unpack here. Um, first of all, you can say um, the quality can be judged by security guarantees of the blocks uh, the blockchain provides. The more secure, the higher the quality. And then he gives examples. So. Without the supply of block space, applications run into congestion or downtime. You can see this on chains when there is a new token mint, a new NFT mint or whatever. In Ethereum, you had these uh, times where the chain was just full, the blocks were full and no one could do anything in DeFi or in any other application. Um, which is not uh, the ideal case because uh, you cannot rely on a system where uh, the system goes down because there is an NFT mint. Uh, leading users to experience high fees, uh, which means regular users are priced out and only the people that can afford to pay for the fees can keep using the chain, which is not the ideal case when you want to have a decentralized, uh, low-key uh, system that gives access to everyone. Long wait times or front running. So, yeah, uh, you just run into several problems. Um, and without high quality block space, applications are hacked or drained, which basically means if the if the if it's easy to attack the system, for example, because the security is low, or it's easy to attack the stake because it's too cheap, um, you have low quality block space in the sense that it is easy to attack the system, and your application is not uh, guaranteed to keep operating. Okay, so. Uh, this was the basic definition here of what is block space uh, and it gives us a very intuitive feeling about how we can look at block space and how different offerings uh, uh, differ. And now he goes into qualitative uh, distinctions that we can uh, have when looking at different blockchains. Let's dive deep, deeper into the three main characteristics of block space as a good. Quality, availability, and flexibility. <coughs> quality. As with any good, quality is a major factor for consumers of blocked space to consider. High quality goods fulfill their purpose, and the purpose of block space is to be converted into a permanent record of state machine execution. Okay. I love this sentence because it says something very simple in a complex way, but it also has a lot of interesting concepts that you can think about to Get a, gain a deeper understanding of, of what we're talking about. Okay, so it's about high quality, 
block space. Um, and what he says here, block space is converted into a permanent record of state machine execution, which means the blockchain is generating blocks, block space, block space, block space. And then state machine execution means, let's say you have a smart contract that uh, gives you an NFT or you have a game where the NFT uh, moves from one block to the other or you're having a swap. You're swapping one token against another in a DEX. So this is the state machine execution. Uh, previously, the world was in one state. Maybe you had, let's say you have... <clears throat> uh, you have um, 600 uh, stablecoin USD and you want to swap them for a hundred dot. So in the first uh, moment in time you have 600 set, let's say AUSD. And then you swap them and then in the uh, one black later you have 100 dot. So this was uh, the state machine. Uh, so the state of the chain uh, changed from one state to the next state. And so the whole chain can be considered a state machine. It is a machine that allows you to change the state by interacting with it. This is a term from uh, information science or computer science, and it basically describes a thing that can change its state. And so blockchains are, or uh, the, the blockchain is often considered to be a state machine. And as the blockchain creates new blocks, new block space, the block space is converted into permanent records. So it is converted into the things that you can see when you're looking at a block explorer and looking at the stuff that happens there. Okay, so a little bit to unpack here. Within this framing, quality is equivalent to security. Quality is equivalent to security. So the, how secure the blockchain is, you can consider this a property of the quality of the chain. I will use the two terms the two descriptions interchangeably, interchangeably. So he will sometimes say security, he will sometimes say quality going forward. Insecure or low quality block space is vulnerable to 51% attacks. So uh, you can attack it with having more nodes or having more stake. And consensus faults, which could imply, uh, yeah. Um, under the hood, security is determined by two factors. The consensus protocol, which is used to secure it, and the amount of uh, real economic security utilized in the production and commitment of block space. Um, so two factors are determining the quality. The consensus protocol, which is used, so it, it depends a lot on what is the actual protocol that you're using here. Uh, can be proof of work, can be proof of stake, and there are different proof of stake offerings. Um, and however it works, it, it is just different. So proof of work and proof of stake are very different in nature, have different advantages and dif disadvantages. And depending on how you use them, you have different attack vectors, for example. In proof of stake, you have to buy the biggest stake to access it, with, uh, which can be difficult. And in proof of work, you have to gain the most uh, nodes or hash power to attack it. So different qualities here. And the amount of real economic security Ah, okay, so yeah, I, I switched it up here. Um, so the, the amount of economic security, so how much hash a rate or how much stake you have, and the protocol itself, which basically is the quality of, of uh, how is it implemented, are there any attack vectors and so on. Okay. Uh, and these two together uh, determine the quality of the offering. Okay, let's go into the next thing, which is availability. The availability of block space is determined by supply and demand. So how much block space is made available uh, and how much demand is there for block space. Um, the supply of block space is driven by the throughput and liveness of the system producing it. Liveness means is, is it live continuously. Blockchains that stall, halt or require manual intervention and operation will have an intermittent supply of block space. And so stops, stops creating block space. Blockchains which don't maximize throughput will cap out their supply at lower scales. So when the blocks are full, there cannot be more block space that is offered. Blockchains which run on insecure consensus mechanisms will deliver block space without strong guarantees of permanence. Yeah. So how uh, available will the block space will be? Will it be available forever? Is there enough block space or will the blocks cap out? Uh, and will the chain stop? Yeah. All these determine the availability. And then we go into flexibility. 
Flexibility is the ability of the block space to be used in different types of operations. Bitcoin and Ethereum block space is somewhat flexible in that block space can be allocated to user submitted transactions. However, Bitcoin and Ethereum have a completely transactive block space mechanism which can act only on user submitted transactions. It cannot be used on proactive operations that are performed without user input. Okay, what does this mean? <coughs> it can mean the following. The thing that you have with blockchain, uh, with, with Polkadot parachains is that they uh, not only uh, have to rely on the user input, so calling extrinsics on the chain, but they could, for example, implement an operation that runs at the start of every block or at the end of every block, or just reacts differently, reacts maybe to messages from other chains. So the flexibility of a parachain, of a substrate parachain, can be much higher than what happens on Bitcoin or Ethereum, because Bitcoin and Ethereum always keep reacting to whatever a user is inputting in the terms of a transaction. It will always only be transactive. So it's completely transactive block space mechanisms. Um, and so you see the difference here in how flexible is the chain and what can it do uh, determines a lot the, the, the flexibility of the block space. Most blockchains have not advanced beyond this reactive model. Even most roll-up protocols are preliminary, pri no, primarily focused on user-driven balance transfers and smart contract invocations. The transaction formats, account models, and scripting languages supported by most blockchains are limited. Yeah, so increasing the flexibility by allowing it to do uh, to to work under different paradigms or under many more paradigms um, increases the capacity of the block space in a way that is not determined either by the availability or by the quality in terms of security. Yeah? Uh, so flexibility is the third big component that we can look here, look at here. Highly flexible. Okay, so highly flexible block space focuses entirely on execution, storage and data consumption and leaves it up to the consumer of block space how to allocate those base resources to reactive or proactive operations. Block space consumers should be able to prioritize first. OK, let's first unpack this one sentence. So highly flexible block space focuses entirely on execution, storage, and data consumption. So the, the, the block space just focuses on that, and that one thing that it can execute, store, and consume data properly, and leave it up to the consumer of block space how to allocate those base resources. So who is the consumer of the block space? This was defined above. The consumer of the block space is the application layer. So the applications uh, can allocate those base resources. They can tap into the block space and use it to reactive or proactive operations. So not sure if I understand it 100% correctly. My reading is that even a parachain is a, a block space consumer in that it can tap into the block space that is made available by the relay chain. It's, it's possible that I'm wrong here, but I'm reading it this way. The relay chain makes the block space available and the parachain consumes the block space because it is on the application layer, is providing an application um, and, uh, and is consuming this block space and allocating the resources. So it gets the block space and then the parachain can say, okay, I want to use the blockchain to for example, uh, put transactions there, that, um, put, uh, put swaps there, or if it's a metaverse chain, then it, uh, then it creates, puts, uh, uses it for uh, storing the game, uh, state change, and so on. Or if it's, for example, robonomics, then it's about uh, uh, con communicating with uh, robots or communicating with Internet of Things devices, IoT devices, and so on. So the consumer allocates the space, the block space that is made available to the parachain, to the consumer, uh, to reactive or pro proactive operations. Block space consumers should be able to prioritize first class application logic relative to user submitted transactions, so they can make meaningful progress even in the absence or overabundance of user submitted transactions. 
So block space consumers, for example, parachains, should be able to prioritize first class application logic, which means the runtime, the parachain, should be so smart to decide what to do with the block space in the most optimal way. It does, there shouldn't even be a user transaction and the blocks, the parachain, the, the consumer should be able to make smart decisions about how to best utilize the block space. Maybe in certain times when the user is not there, it can perform operations that it usually would perform, uh, couldn't perform when there is a lot of demand. Uh, it's a little bit far thinking into the future, but I can see a future where uh, the pair chain reacts to the current demand and maybe performs operations uh, at a later stage uh, when there is less demand right now. This is not to say that transactive models are bad. In fact, it's the opposite. Transactive ex execution models can be used with good effect in interoperation with autonomous execution models. Okay, so transactive ex execution models, the user calls it autonomous execution models, the chain decides on its own what to do um, or, or does certain stuff at the beginning or end of the block or maybe in the middle. The underlying product behind both of these is block space. And block space can only support both models when it is maximally flexible. Flexible block space is a prerequisite for deep block space markets. Oh, okay, this is getting interested now. Interesting now. Deep block space markets. Are we going to go into this in the in the last chapter? To add more nuance, we should acknowledge the fact that modern block space applications are based on interoperability between state machines utilizing block space. Okay, so you have many different chains and they interoperate to utilize the block space. Mixing low quality block space with high quality spoils entire applications and exposes users to catastrophic tail risks. Sorry, what this means is that if you have a high quality chain with a lot of security and a low quality chain where it's easily to attack the chain, maybe with a 51% attack, um, you are risking the whole application, you're putting the whole application at catastrophic tail risk because if you can compromise the one chain, uh, the whole process that is being executed is at risk. If we were building a restaurant, we wouldn't serve our customers a meal prepared with mostly high quality ingredients mixed with a small amount of garbage. It's a great example. Likewise, application developers shouldn't serve the customers and users applications composed of mostly high security block space and partially low security block space. The low quality ingredient ruins the rest of the dish. And let's do a, let's do a simple example. Or let's, yeah. So let's do a simple example. Let's say you're doing a cross chain swap uh, you want to send if no. Um, let's do do a simple example. Let's say you have a low quality chain. Let's call it I don't know. Let's call it I don't know. Let's call it food chain. It doesn't really matter. Uh, and you want to uh, send a token from food chain to uh, Polkadot. And there, let's say there is a bridge chain uh, that uh, that allows you to bridge from food chain to Polkadot. Now, if you were to send a uh, one thousand foo. Uh, from one account to another and you have to bridge it so it there is a transaction committed on food chain and uh, it says uh, I'm sending this 1000 foo to the bridge now it goes to the bridge it comes out of the bridge on, on Polkadot and now Polkadot says okay you now own 1000 foo but let's say food chain is of low quality and it gets attacked so, um, for example, you have a 51% attack, 51% uh, of the stake or the hash power, and the attacker reverts the transaction. So, he basically commits to the chain that the transaction never happened because maybe another block was happening and the transaction never really went into the bridge. Now, the problem you're having is you're having a double spend. On food chain, on the attacked food chain, uh, the 1000 foo were never sent, but on poker, it's already committed that the 1000 foo were sent. So, what it basically says is you have a low quality block space offering with food chain and a high quality uh, block space offering with Polkadot and you cannot really mix them because if you use the low you have to default to the lower quality offering to assume what is your security guarantee right so um, 
Yeah, the low quality ingredient ruins the rest of the dish. In the interoperable world, applications seeking to minimize risk to their users should only use high security block space to deliver an end product. Yeah. If you want to have a high quality a application, you need high quality block space and you cannot mix bullshit into it. Okay. Modern applications need parallel block space with predictable and consistently high quality. Okay, now we're going into it because parallel block space basically implies there can be blockchains running in parallel and you want to tap into both offerings. You want to have both high, uh, and you want to have both uh, of being of high quality because if you're mixing the services, if you're using them together, both of them need to be of high quality. Furthermore, a class of block space is best suited to interoperable applications when all the block space in the class provides homogeneous security guarantees. Which basically means if, you, if all of them have the same security guarantees or similar nature security guarantees, the whole application also has the same security guarantee. In essence, interoperability is asynchronous state machine composability okay <laughs> and another one of these interesting sentences so interoperability the ability of, of chains to interoperate is asynchronous state machine composability okay so we, uh, we unpacked the term state machine before basically every blockchain or every runtime is a state machine that transitions from one state to another and when they're asynchronous means they are operating at different speeds, at different clock times, they are not synchronized, they are working somehow uh, apart from each other, and you want to compose them together. When you're able to compose state machines that work out of synchronicity with each other, they just work on their own, and you are able to compose them together, this is what we define as interoperability. Okay. A re reliable network of asynchronously composed state, reliable network of asynchronously composed state machines unlocks super additive value. Ah, uh, beautiful. So it unlocks super uh, additive value. When you have asynchronous, uh, asynchronously composed state machines, so different chains are running in parallel and they have the same quality, the same security, it unlocks super additive value. So basically what you're saying is, there are network effects. The more of these chains you can combine, the better network effects you have. And it is not only like adding linear value, it's like, oh, it's nice, it's super additive. So it unlocks capabilities that you didn't have before. Uh, imagine a computer. A computer is having different components that are working together. You have a CPU, you have a processor, you have a hard disk, you have a network component, you have maybe a GPU, uh, you have the, 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 the uh, RAM memory, and all of these are working together to unlock super additive value because they're very specialized components that work together to give you a computer, a machine that can do incredible stuff, connect to the internet and do all the stuff that you're doing. Super additive value. And the classes of block space best suited to this thesis are those which provide standard and strong guarantees of security. So what is best fit to give you the super additive value? Standard and strong guarantees of security. Creating value without incurring additional risk. So it is dependent on the security and the decentralization of the network. The implications of this is huge because it's basically saying you cannot outsource the stuff to maybe a centralized solution or uh, you know, a chain that is sort of somewhat a little bit secure. Uh, uh, but the, you, the most hard and the most secure resources is the thing that unlocks this potential for you. These classes of block space are said to provide shared security for all block space within them. Okay, so you're basic, he's, this is basically the, this sentence here, this paragraph is crucial because it's basically the reasoning for why you need a solution like Polkadot or Kusama because it provides shared security for all block space within them. Super important paragraph. Okay. I'm running a little bit out of voice here, so maybe we're taking a break here uh, after, after this chapter here and then make a second chapter later. Okay, scaling solutions answer the block space supply problem. Okay, so 
first we just said okay we need this super additive um, um, mega bullish dragon block space this this just superior block space offering we want to have this okay now scaling solutions answer the block space supply problem the, the, the thing is how can you get as much of this block space as possible you need a scaling solution to get as much of it as possible sharding and rollups for example use crypto economics to scale by introducing proof or dispute protocols or in the default case not every validator needs to check every state transition Scaling solutions can be coupled with shared security architectures to address both the need for supply and quality. Okay, what does he mean here? So he means sharding and rollups, for example, like parachains uh, have or, or uh, um, in other uh, systems. Use crypto economics to scale by introducing proof or dispute protocols. So usually what you say is when you have a rollup, um, the problem, that, the basic problem is the, uh, that you have is when you have, let's say you want to have a thousand or a million parachains. The problem is if every computer in the network validates everything at the same time, you're just limited in resources. Because not every, if you have, like, it's, let's say you want to validate the network on a Raspberry Pi. A Raspberry Pi cannot perform, I don't know, a trillion or quadrillion or whatever transactions at the same time. If you want to have a network that scales and does many different things in parallel to have the offering that we were just discussing. So if you want to have parallel blockchains executing at the same time, at some point you're reaching this limit where a single computer cannot execute it at the same time. And so the, the way to scale it is to shard it, to basically parcel it out to different machines. And this was the, the big problem that uh, after the initial launch of Ethereum, they were starting to discuss it. So how can we scale up the execution? Because the problem that Ethereum is facing is just, uh, you know, there is an NFT mint and the whole network stops because, or the whole network gets just much more expensive. And so what every network it needs to do is to shard, to split out the work into different chains. But now you have the conflict or a problem is how can you give the same guarantee, security guarantees if everything is executed or calculated by different machines, right? And so this is the whole sharding problematic that is being worked on by the brightest minds in the space. Uh, and, and one of the solutions is rollups, basically. Yeah? Uh, and so it introduces proof and dispute protocols, which basically means you can say in, in a simple case, only a few machines uh, get tasked with checking uh, this uh, blockchain and how uh, one specific blockchain or one shard is executing its stuff. And you can say, okay, let's put this work, let's put this work to 10 machines or maybe 20 or five, it doesn't really matter, just some amount of machines and not the whole validator set. And they are checking uh, if this is properly executed. And usually, uh, if they are not colluding, if there is at least one honest machine, it would detect if there is a fraud. And if there is a fraud, then it can say, nah, uh, this is wrong. Um, so, uh, sort of, you're splitting the risk. Um, and still, everyone could be looking out for frauds. And even if, the f if let's say, five machines are colluding uh, and validating the transaction of this one uh, shard or this one parachain, uh, even then, there could be some other node or some other machine or someone else in the network saying, ah, ah, this is wrong, and basically send, submit a dispute. And then the stake in the proof of stake could be slashed if it is uh, found that there was really a cheating going on, if there's really a fraud going on. Right? So you're splitting out the work that is performed by the whole validator set into different validator subsets, and uh, only a subset of the machine is testing, proving if the... Uh, the parachain or the shard was submitting the correct block. Uh, yeah. So this is the general solution to this problem. And in the default case, not every validator has to check every state transition. And if someone is uh, finding a fraud, then it's uh, disputing this and then all validators check will check the single transaction or the state transi transition if it was true or not. Scaling solutions can be coupled with shared security architectures to address both the need for supply and quality. Okay, so 
you know how excited I was about this paragraph. Uh, this uh, paragraph is similar. So in this, in the first paragraph, we introduced we need many many chains running in parallel to have super additive value, uh, to have increased the quality. Uh, and in this paragraph here, we're saying the solution to increase the supplies by sharding it uh, with things like sharding and uh, rollups. Okay, last two paragraphs. Some ecosystems are now recognizing the need for shared security architectures, but they use voluntary opt-in validators to determine how much security different block space products under the shared security umbrella receive. Okay, this is, this is a loaded sentence. So what it basically means is you have there are, there are different ecosystems right now working on the multi-chain future. Uh, and they have different assumptions, they, they have different angles from which they are coming at this. Uh, uh, to my understanding, the main providers in this space are Polkadot, Cosmos, and I think also Avalanche, and I'm sure there are also other ones. Um, and so some ecosystems are now recognizing the need for shared security architectures. So what he's implying here is, for example, the way Polkadot works with the relay chain, it offers the security to all the parachains which are rolling up into it. Um, and when you have mu multiple chains, they could also source their own security and then communicate with each other, which basically introduces the problem of uh, higher quality and lower uh, quality offerings. And shared security is the basic concept that says uh, if you can share the security between many chains, they are basically falling under the same. Oops, uh, they are falling under the same quality assumptions or the same shared security. But some of them uh, use voluntary opt-in by validators to determine how much security different block space products under the shared security umbrella receive. So he is pointing out a possible error of fault in thinking where you say if there is a voluntary opt-in by validators, they could, every validator could decide if they now secure one chain under the umbrella or not. But basically what this implies is that the quality is not the same under the security, under this security umbrella. Uh, the different chains could receive different security and you, you have a harder time determining how secure the whole solution actually is. And so what Rob is saying, that is, pure, pure, that is poor architecture because it enshrines particular validators as a rent-seeking special interest group, which supplicants must appeal to in order to get the project started or adequately secured. So he says, when there is a voluntary opt-in, it means you have just um, a fragmentation of security under the security umbrella and uh, it puts the validators into a rent-seeking special interest group uh, so they can now basically uh, gain so much power in the system that everyone has, appeal, has to appeal to them to uh, get their security. Uh, and it can put the whole ecosystem at risk. Uh, you have this, uh, for example, in Ethereum, you have uh, this situation where you have MEV and uh, mine extractable value and basically the nodes can uh, are being bribed to either include your transaction or not or put it in a space where it is disadvantageous for you because another uh, uh, tra trader is stealing or maybe they're just uh, enforcing uh, liquidations or, or just manipulating the, the, the state of the chain in a way to extract the most value possible. Um, and uh, in a multi-chain world, this could evolve into a situation where the validators are just uh, getting so much power that everyone has to appeal to them to even be included uh, in the block uh, in the blocks in the state transitions. So you have uh, could have get a very tilted situation that basically puts the whole decentralization project at risk because now it would uh, be go towards more centralization towards uh, validators. Barriers to entry between supply and demand have the potential to reduce both the availability and quality of block space. So now Rob is showing uh, uh, us how this can introduce a huge problem because if uh, 
if you're not even guaranteed in a, in, a, in a consensus system to get your blocks in, to get your transactions in, what is the availability of the service actually? If it is determined by MEV uh, rent seeking actors uh, to say, ah, oh, how much are you bribing me to get the block in? If there is a bribe included and someone else is paying a higher bribe, you can say, okay, then just pay the bribe. But what if, what if someone else is paying the higher bribe to get the uh, transaction included in the block? This is not how you can build a system because it's not available. Uh, and the quality is suffering because if someone else is just cheating and extracting values from your users, what is the block space actually worth? Right? So this is a strong argument. This is a strong implied argument against MEV. Application and protocol developers should pay particular attention to these three characteristics and structure the application more so around block space than blockchains or smart contracts. Decentralized, so this is basically a summary uh, of all that we said before. Don't think about uh, a specific block chain so much when you're thinking about deploying your application, but think about the whole block space offering. Don't look at a single chain, look at all the chains under a security umbrella, look at are they properly secured, uh, is there equal opportunity for everyone, and how flexible, how diverse is the offering. And this is how you should look at the at the offering when you're determining where you would launch your application. So the strong argument for Polkadot actually. Decentralized applications protocols can operate at a lower cost to the users or token holders by acquiring block space on demand instead of running a chain 24-7. It's, yeah, so it, it, now he's adding the flexibility of saying, okay, uh, you don't need block space all the time, you can get it on demand. So this is opening up uh, an, another angle that we're going to look at much deeper in the last chapter. It's quite common for early stage blockchains to leak a large amount of tokens to validators, producing blocks with minimal underlying usage. Uh, yeah, so, um, basically, what you're saying here is you have a blockchain is not really utilized. There is not really much utilization, but it still runs 24-7. And uh, the, the validators, the node operators are being paid in tokens to keep the network running without it really being used. Um, this is a side effect of inefficient block space allocation, which primarily benefits validators at the expense of application developers and token holders, because of course it dilutes the value. Cloud computing outcompeted, okay, this is interesting now, this argument. Cloud computing outcompeted dedicated server space because it allowed physical resources in a more granular and adaptive manner. Yeah? So um, previously you were only uh, able to rent uh, server 24 seven, uh, for a month or so, but cloud computing gives you the resources on demand exactly as much as you need it. And so the argument here is that if block space offerings evolve into the direction of becoming so adaptive that you can really get them on demand just as much block space as you need, uh, it will be the superior offering. Similarly, block space centric architectures for web free base layers will outcompete block chain centric architectures, right? Okay, so this is the whole argument for the article here is that if you are not thinking about blockchains and how you can optimize it, but rather about the block space that you're creating, this will be superior in the way that you can just think more flexibly, more adaptively, uh, allocate resources much better. Uh, it's still, uh, the argument is still on an abstract level, but it's, for me personally, it's a super convincing argument. And it just shows us that we're only at the beginning of this because we're just at the start of exploring of, okay, we're now having a multi-chain world. We have many different blockchains. They're starting to communicate. Uh, and now the whole topic is around how can we allocate block space? How can we market block space? Uh, how, uh, all the topics of fairness and unfairness and centralization regarding block space. And we're just at the start, the beginning of this whole discussion, right? Um, but this is a very important think piece here. This is the first part of the video. I will do a second part of the video uh, on this. And in the second part of the video, we will be discussing how is Polkadot looking at this whole situation? 
And this is a very interesting chapter here, mechanisms for allocating block space, which opens up the whole mindset about how we can think about block space uh, in terms of uh, making it even more flexible. So if you followed along this part so far, uh, thank you for watching. Uh, see you next time. Of course, make sure to follow me on Twitter at Edison Bob. Uh, and yeah, all the best to you. Goodbye.